it took me half the day to not be angry anymore because I sat there and I watched uh nine minutes I didn't realize it was nine minutes and 29 seconds of George Floyd losing his life uh I thought it was 8 46 no it was actually 9 29 9 29 in the opening statement the prosecutor broke down what we were about to see and I saw it before and I still wasn't ready so let me welcome back to the show she is a Minnesota attorney law professor uh she currently lives in Minneapolis she's Howard trained Howard Law uh, journal. She was also, uh, she attended Howard and she was editor in chief of the Howard Law Journal. Let me welcome back to the show, the one and only Professor Angie Porter. Welcome. Thank you so much, Professor Hunter. Thanks for having me back. And I hope you're doing all right. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I, got, I, I appreciate that. A lot of people like, I couldn't watch it. My, my heart, my spirit, my spirit could take it. And I owed it to George Floyd to watch it again. I owed it to George Floyd and all of the George Floyds before him, some whose names we don't know, uh, right. who lost their lives at the hands of somebody who was that evil. I owed it to him to watch. And I didn't want to watch. Angie, right. I didn't want to watch, but right. I owed it to him to watch because you know, my, my Jewish brothers and sisters have this never forget. And around this time, around April, you're going to see a lot of Holocaust remembrances. And they give you all of the nasty details of those concentration camps. And there are movies and TV shows and documentaries. And they give right. you all of the every single nastiness that happened from, from Crystal Knock all the way through the last liberation. And they do it every year. And it's painful to watch it. Right. But they make sure you what? never forget we don't have the luxury unfortunately where we are right now to tune it out and self-care mm -hmm. is important but this is part of the self-care to never forget what happened and keep it at the forefront of our spirit so that it'll never happen again because we remember what that pain is so i Absolutely. watched it Absolutely. i watched it i watched it too and um i feel the same way you know for me I, there's not even a calculation or choice about whether to watch this. I do understand that some people don't want to, um, but I think particularly for our people, um, we don't turn away. We stare it in the face because there are a lot of white folks around Minnesota who've never seen that video. So people are wondering, you know, during jury selection, how is it that people didn't watch the video? And it's because they can so easily turn away, I think. The experience is so different. And I remember telling a white woman back in May um, when she said to me, you know, I can't watch that. I just told her, I don't have that luxury. I have to see this. I have to stare this in the face because it's exactly what you said. Who's gonna, who's gonna bear witness so we can prevent this? Some, somebody has to, some of us have to. And apparently you feel the same way so i was watching it right alongside from from afar right with you the legal strategy to play the nine minutes and 29 seconds and and I, again it went from 8 46 because that was the number yeah. that we were to 9 29 and the perspective of 9 29 is is a little different because mm -hmm. when the prosecutor talks about the four minutes Yes. After he lost consciousness. Yeah. Four more minutes. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Talk talk about the strategy today and whether you thought it was good or not and, and what the defense did, because you watch more of it than I did because I had to do a radio show at three o'clock. Well, I watch it so that you don't have to. So that's my pleasure. And it's an honor always to be chatting with you about this. Um, so the strategy on both sides. I'm gonna step back for a second as we talk about this because I think people need to understand what opening statements means in the overall strategic lay of the land in trial. So trial is like a performance and the jury is the audience. And a lot of people watching are the incidental audience. Um, but the attorneys, they know exactly what evidence is gonna come in. Um, it's a well-rehearsed dance. They know the rules they have to navigate to bring evidence in. So there are no real surprises for them, but this is like a play. And they have three chances to talk to the jurors directly. 
The first chance was during jury selection when they individually had a conversation with the jurors and questioned them and uh, kind of coached them a little bit, educated them on their perspectives through their questions. The second opportunity was this morning, opening statements. And the third opportunity is going to be closing arguments. That's it. The rest of this trial, they don't speak directly to the jury. They speak to witnesses who can sort of talk to the jury and they ask them to explain things to the jury. But other than that, <clears throat> the lawyers aren't talking to the jury during this case. So this was really their chance to introduce themselves, introduce their theme, and tell them what they're going to see. Tell them what to keep an eye out for during this four week trial. That's absolutely critical. So we saw the, the prosecution start off. Now the prosecution has a team of three attorneys. So that's a little confusing sometimes to navigate but we started off with Jerry Blackwell. And I'm gonna talk about Jerry Blackwell for a second. He's a black attorney in Minneapolis has his own firm in Minneapolis. I've actually sat in the offices of that firm to uh, attend meetings of the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. Jerry Blackwell is one of the founders of Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. We call it Mabel here, Mabel. Um, so he's well known. And as I mentioned on a previous conversation with you, he earned the posthumous pardon of one of the three black circus workers who was lynched in Duluth, Minnesota, 101 years ago. Um, that was the first posthumous pardon in Minnesota. So we know him, we like him. He's not a, a prosecutor you know, in his regular job, but he's a brilliant attorney on the civil side. So he opened today, which was actually a little bit of a surprise for me. Steve Schlischer has been the one we've seen in jury selection. So I thought, oh, they're gonna go with Steve, who's like this career prosecutor. They went with Jerry Blackwell and I thought he did a brilliant job laying out the case. Uh, I'd be curious to hear if you agree, Professor. No, I, I, um, Johnny Cochran came to mind because there was a measured way, like he's not soft-spoken, but he's not bombastic. He's, right. he's not methodical. So there's a little theater, but not, it's not theatrical. Right. And I thought his tone was perfection. And, and he made it clear for me, you know, and I've, I've followed the case, but I didn't even know some of the things that he was. So he yeah. telegraphed what we were going to see, which I thought was brilliant. So I'm like, they're going to actually play the video. Okay. But before the video, he said at this, and he had this timeline at this minute, you're going to see this at minute four, you're going to see this. You're going to see the, the paramedics show up. You're going to see the paramedics show up and he's still not taking his knee off the neck. The paramedics are there. You're going to see people asking to take his pulse. Then he brought the little black girl in with the t-shirt. I, I was like, oh, if Derek Chauvin is a convicted, right. there's right. no America. I'm just going to let y'all know all bets are off because what he did in that opening statement was masterful in terms of giving them no wiggle room yeah. to Master make a case for anything but that knee on that neck, on that back, causing this man to die. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know how he did that was he started off by telling us what we were going to see, which is what you do typically during opening statements. You can't really make arguments interpreting the evidence at that point. You just preview it. So you heard a lot of, you're going to see, you're going to learn, you're going to hear. And he laid out exactly which witnesses we were going to see. But as you mentioned, he preempted the defense opening by saying, this is what there, you, this is what this case is not about. It's not about drugs. It's not about all this other stuff they're gonna wave at you over here, the red herrings. It's about what you will see. And I liked, he had a couple of catchphrases in there. Uh, Chauvin didn't let up, he didn't get up. He doesn't let up, he doesn't get up. And he returned to that. Um, and then for causation, as we talked about, that was gonna be a big issue, still is. He said, this is about what you will see. Essentially, 
don't get distracted by this drug talk or this talk about George Floyd's pre-existing conditions. Don't get caught up. You know what happened. Look at the video. And then they showed the video, which is the most powerful piece of evidence, which most of us are familiar with. Um, and they showed it from start to finish, uninterrupted, so that every juror, whether they saw the little clip or not, had to stare in the face of that video. The full nine minutes and 29 seconds, like you said. Uh, I didn't realize it was a paramedic lady, white lady came up. Can oh, I take the his fire pulse? Fight. The fire firefighter, fight. I'm sorry, yeah. yes. Firefighter was like, I just want to take, and then he's going to reach for the taser. He's going to reach for the pepper spray, rather. Yeah. I didn't realize George Floyd, Floyd had soiled himself with the stream of urine. And I'm like, let me, let my uh -huh. heart broke into so many uh -huh. pieces today, Angie, uh -huh. uh, Angie Porter. I'm, I'm, I was sitting there and I was like, that's what happens when you die. Your body releases. Mm -hmm. And so I know I watched this man die. I know, I, I know fundamentally I've seen this video before, but I know the exact moment when he died. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yes. Yeah, and that's why they played that. That strategically is why they played that. No one can look away. No one in this courtroom can look away. And you know, as the jurors are watching that, um, you know, I've been in courtrooms where we play video and the person in the video is in the courtroom. Please believe, although we won't see the jurors, they were looking at that on the screen and they were looking at Chauvin. They either did it as the video was rolling or they did it shortly thereafter. But they're piecing together that man sitting over there is the man in this video. And that is powerful. Jerry Blackwall also, as the glasses on his forehead didn't move, like he, he's, he's showing the cavalier hands and his glasses, sunglasses yeah. never, never shifted from his head. Yeah. And he talks about all of the moments Chauvin was told, uh, should we turn him on the side? Um, he passed out. Uh, and even when the ambulance is there, not until the gurney was right there, did he take his knee off his neck. And that's actually been a theme we've seen through the witnesses as well. Uh, they stayed there. So clearly something was wrong. He also mentioned the police witnesses that are going to come in, uh, Professor Hunter. The police little... chief. I know the police chief. I was like, yeah. what? When does that happen, Angie yeah. Porter? When is the police oh. chief? Oh, is there a blue <laughs> wall of silence? If there's a blue wall of silence, when does the police chief become a prosecution witness? You took the words right out of my mouth. Now, we knew there was some indication that this was going to be the strategy. Uh, I've been calling it the bad apple theory. My friend, uh, Aya Helmy, who's an attorney here as well, she said that yesterday, the bad apple theory. That means they're gonna get all the good apples and put them on the witness stand. I was surprised though, that Chief Arredondo was gonna be a witness just because like you said, never really see the chief, um, but he's gonna go down there. And that is probably a decision. That's a wise decision to create more trust in the Minneapolis Police Department. Also though, uh, and we're talking with Angie Porter. I mean, you can follow her at Angie, A-N-G-I, Marissa, M-A-R-Y-S-S-A. -S -S -A. I was also thinking, though, it absolves the Minneapolis police. It absolves the United States police force. It absolves police unions all over this country from culpability of a systemic issue that they have to, to paint this one person as an anomaly. He is a, a bad apple, as you say. He is, he, he did something, everything against the training. The system's not the problem. It's this Derek Chauvin guy. They're throwing him under the bus. They're doing what Snowfall did with the fat guy to, to take the brat for Leon, Leon for Lee. And, and they're, they're going to serve him up, even though he actually did the, the crime in this case. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because it sounds like that's what they're doing. <laughs> I am so glad you raised this because this is something I've been talking about. I mean, it's a nuanced thing that you just raised, but it's such a good point. Uh, recently, I've been reading a book called The Black and the Blue by Matthew Horace, who uh, is a Minnesota resident actually now after a storied career around the country. But 
Matthew Horace is a black officer. And in this book, he just outlines a litany of crimes by police across the country. It was written before last year. So I'd be really curious to hear his thoughts on what's going on right now. But in any case, in the last pages of that book, he says what you just said. It's not about certain police being an aberration. It's about a culture of the police department and a culture that extends beyond to the city. And so all that we've seen with the city settlement, with this trial strategy, which I think is strategic, right? It's the winning strategy under the law, but it's a fiction. He's not an aberration. There's a reason he was able to be on the police force for 19 years and get away with doing this in his 19th year. There's a reason when Thomas Lane urged him not to, or urged him to turn George Floyd on his side, that Chauvin could just cavalierly say, no, he's staying put. That's not just Chauvin. The other officers acquiesced with that. They, you know, none of them raised the alarm. So this is a cultural thing. And there's a reason we're here after Philando Castile, that was in St. Paul, but still, we're still in the same community practically, after Jamar Clark, that's culture. That's persistence of culture. The city of Minneapolis was okay with apparently not training these officers well enough to prevent something so heinous and brazen. So it is a fiction, the bad apple theory. It's a fiction. But I do think it's a fiction that's gonna work in this individual yeah. case. But what hurts is what happens beyond this case. Yeah, that's what I, I after watching the opening statement uh, today, and it was smart for them to have uh, Mr. Blackwell. I yeah. said, okay, J Derek Chauvin, they're gonna sacrifice. They're gonna serve him up. He's going down. And I, I, I was mixed. I felt mixed about it because I'm like, okay, like yeah. Justin Volpe, like, you know, like Mohammed Noor, like, uh, exactly. you know, I can't even name enough because there aren't that many police officers that get convicted in this country of doing right. heinous things, but they're right. going to serve up somebody and Derek Chauvin's going down and, uh, there's not much to defense. Defense is going to be, you know, people were upset about the defense today. But I'm like, that's their job. They got to come up with the George Floyd was a drug addict. But actually, they're yeah. undermining their case to me, because if you know that he's addicted to drugs, if you know he's addicted to drugs. And, and the other thing Blackwell said, police officers, I forgot the, the phrasing. And maybe you can help me, uh, Professor Porter. He said that their job is to, while you're in their care to to to. Uh. to what, yes. what, was that, what was that phrase like you they, they're they're charged to take care of you when you're yes. in their care i wrote that down in in your custody is in your care in your custody is in your care absolutely uh yeah and you're absolutely right people are upset about what the defense attorney is doing um we expect that not saying it's right, but that's fully expected. And it has to be expected so that the, prosec the prosecution needs to expect that so they can adequately rebut that. So these are kind of age old tactics on the defense side. They're painting out George Floyd to be, and I actually think Dr. Carr posted about this on Twitter. But, <laughs> Super um, Negro, <laughs> this, yeah. Uh, yeah. this, this uh, Negro so tall. hopped up on drugs that he can't yep. be controlled. Exactly. Such a troll. A ne'er do well, who was a drug dealer. You noticed in the in the opening statement, he made a point not to say George Floyd's vehicle. He said the Mercedes Benz, and that's to pull at all that fear from suburbia that this is a drug dealer driving a car, you know, he's a kingpin. All of these things are meant to have us focus on George Floyd rather than Derek Chauvin. And to introduce doubt and plant seeds of doubt about cause of death. I agree though, you're right. Like if they knew he was on some drugs, it's not, the response of pinning him down is not the correct response. And actually, you just hit on one of the policies that's going to come out in this trial. When they bring the police witnesses up, they're going to talk about Minneapolis police training manuals. And one of those are publicly available now. So one of those manuals says that very thing. It says when you use force, 
you have to consider all these factors. Does the person have mental illness? Are they going through some sort of episode? Uh, the person, you know, it lists all these factors. And one of the factors is whether they are under the influence of drugs or alcohol, because that then is a health risk. It's a health risk. And so you're not supposed to pin someone down for nine minutes and 29 seconds. And I think Blackwell said, don't listen to them talking about split second decisions and being in the heat of the moment because that's what the defense is gonna do, bring these officers in and say, it's a hard job, it's heat of the moment, split second. And he talked about how many seconds are in nine minutes and 29 seconds. That's not a split second. That's 300 some, I, I, I forgot the number. But that's all these seconds. No, I'm, yeah, I'm math is not thousands yeah, of seconds. Not, <laughs> a lot of seconds. Uh, a lot of we're with seconds, not a split second. Professor Angie Porter is here. Uh, tell us about Jenna Scurry, the nine one one dispatcher, and why she was the first witness, and why that was important. Yeah, so we were kind of thinking about that. Just some friendly banter with other attorneys in town. I don't think it's unusual to start with witnesses this way. I think they wanted to ease in and tell a story. So the order of the witnesses is going to be a narrative device. Again, this is a this is like a play. So we're starting with the first contact. Where we start is important. The defense, if it were up to the defense, they were going to start at Cup Foods because that's their narrative. Uh-uh, that's not the narrative. Cup, of Cup Foods is where the so-called $20 uh, yeah. counterfeit bill was passed, which is a misdemeanor, by the way. Misdemeanor, yeah. misdemeanor, misdemeanor, bench mm -hmm. warrant, the own, own recognizance, no jail time, slap, right. you know, fine at best. If right. he did that, where where the $20 end up, by the way? But so that that's Cup Foods, they call the police because they yeah. got a bad bill. Yeah, exactly. So the defense would have wanted to start the story there. Prosecution's like, no, let's start the story where it needs to be started, which is when 911 was called and they dispatched those police out there. We're gonna start with them. And that's, I think, why they introduced Jenna Scurry, uh, woman of color, uh, dispatcher, uh, soft spoken, professional. She's sort of the every woman, you know, hard working on the job. So that's another compelling device is like, She's just doing her job. But the key, you, I don't know if you watched it, Professor Hunter, but there's a, usually a moment when you realize, aha, this is why they called her. The key moment was when she, seven year professional, has been doing this for a long time, when she thought something was wrong. That says a lot. And the moment she thought something was wrong was when they had the, the city cameras up on the screen. Side note, if you didn't think you were being surveilled, I got news for y'all. <laughs> there are cameras everywhere. So let's appreciate that. And you know, working in the courts, you realize there are cameras everywhere, including here. So she sees on the city camera in the dispatch room at work, the incident that she just dispatched police to, which was odd. I feel like there's a backstory there that they're gonna get, it, get to at some point. She looks at the camera, she looks back to do her job. She looks at the camera, looks back to do her job. And at one point she realizes they've been pinned down in that position for the last several minutes. Is it frozen? Something, right, is the camera frozen? Yeah, is the camera frozen? So that means she, in her experience, knew something was amiss. And then it gets even more damning. She calls the sergeant responsible for these officers. She's so disturbed by the length of time that they had pinned this man down that she does something she's never done. Calls the sergeant to say, I don't wanna be a snitch, but they've been pinning this man down. I uh, just want you to know. I don't know if it's use of force or whatever. That was huge. That was huge. And so that was a good witness to lead with in this story. Um, and we got to see another camera angle of the incident as well. So that was powerful stuff. That was- She said, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna be a snitch. Yeah, she did. <laughs> I don't to, mean to snitch, but- 
but <laughs> right, which speaks something to how wrong. remarkable yeah. it was to her. Um, and the fact that she knew something was wrong because she felt she was snitching. What are we going to see this week? Um, I guess, based on what Jerry Blackwell has laid out for us that you think we should be paying attention to Angie Porter, what, what else is going to unfold besides the, of course, the police chief testifying, is he going to testify this week? I don't know. You know, I'm trying to predict their strategy. I think they might bring in bystanders for a while just to get that compelling narrative in of the normal everyday person. Because once you start bringing experts in, including police use of force experts, including medical experts, people sort of turn their brain off. You know, it gets highly technical. So while we have the jury's attention, I think the state will probably continue to bring out these bystander witnesses. And there were several. Um, Today, we had uh, Alicia Euler, who was working at the gas station across the way, and she took several videos right now well they're probably done right now they typically end at 4 30 central time so when when i got on with you they were interviewing donald williams who is a you know black man actually my best friend from back home in rochester minnesota is friends with him um so not too far removed he's a wrestler trained in martial arts he was a bystander. He's the one that you hear on the video cussing them out because he knows what a chokehold is. He knows they shouldn't be doing that type of thing. He worked in security. He worked as a bouncer at a club. So he's he's a witness they were bringing or they were questioning when we started. And, and it also came out, excuse me, that uh, Derek, Derek Chauvin knows martial arts. So he knew, uh, I, I heard that during uh, some, I, I know it was in, in this morning that okay. he knows martial arts. So that okay. move well, was not unknown or unfamiliar, was it? He knew what he was doing. Yes, and thank you for bringing that up because his knowledge is very important here. Something that they didn't mention today, but something that they requested to get into evidence when I was reading the filings were Derek Chauvin's past incidents, incidences of using force. Mm. And the judge allowed them to reference a couple of these instances. So those I think are for sure gonna come in, but the one I'll highlight, well, there's only two. (laughs) I I can briefly highlight them for you. The first one was an incident where Chauvin similarly restrained a man with his hands behind his back. I don't know the race of this man. I would be curious to learn it. But immediately after doing so, turns him into what Blackwell actually referenced today, the side recovery position. Sort of well known that police understand the prone restraint position is a dangerous position to put someone in with your hands behind your back. It does restrict your breathing. So they are trained to turn you on your side immediately as soon as they can to let a person recover. There's a past instance of Chauvin doing that. So, you know, in addition to the martial arts thing that you heard, Chauvin knows I'm supposed to turn somebody on their side. So then the question becomes, why didn't he do that here? There's another case that they're going to probably reference where he pinned down a woman, handcuffed her, hands behind her back, dragged her outside, put her in put her on the sidewalk, that's what the body cam showed, but the police report said they put her in the grass. So there's a, a question mark, dishonesty. Pinned her down like he did George Floyd. Um, I think he knelt on her back and she wasn't resisting. So again, I'm curious to know what, what was the race of this person? Um, and why did he treat her differently when she wasn't resisting at all? So that I think is gonna come in, that's gonna be pretty damning. And contrary to what Eric Nelson, Chauvin's attorney, said during his opening statement, uh, this case is not about a social cause. Uh, He knows that that's BS. He knows that his client does not look good when it comes to being a racist. Uh, And he better be prepared to fight that perception because prosecution is ready. They about to bring in some evidence that makes him look even worse than he currently looks. 
And outside the courthouse, George Floyd's family, they knelt today for eight minutes and 46 seconds. They might need to kneel for nine minutes and 29 seconds tomorrow because that's the exact amount of time he was on that ground uh, fighting for his life. Mm-hmm. And uh, everyone's watching all over the globe, not just here in America. This is an indictment of this country. What happens in this trial? Conviction or acquittal? Because, you know, as I said earlier, this, what's on trial is not just Derek Chauvin. Right. So, right. yeah, this is going to be interesting. Cool. All right. Listen, um, I, I appreciate your service. I love I love that you uh, know so much and that you're here every week uh, kind of laying this out for us. Thank uh, you so much for having no, me. No, you're amazing. Um, how do you care for yourself? What, what, did, what methods do you have to cleanse your palate, your spiritual palate in the wake of this? You know, I am a spiritual person. I think about ancestors a lot. So to center myself, I often talk with them, think about them and know that our ancestors have been through so much. They've been through actually worse than what we go through. And somehow that gives me strength knowing that there are lessons we can take from the past. Um, This is very much a similar instance to many instances in the past. And I think we can at least be comforted in knowing that there's so much attention to this. There's, we're learning, we're as a community growing and connecting and connecting those dots to the past and that's powerful. As an attorney, and so if there's any law students listening or anyone interested in law, the thing they don't teach you in law school is just how emotionally taxing things can be. Um, just how jarring it can be to watch videos and see photos and hear this testimony, um, that's not something that they teach. And you can actually tell looking at some lawyers that they never learn (laughs) how to have empathy or tap into that human side of themselves. And so I would say for lawyers and non-lawyers alike, allow yourself to be human, take care of yourself. Um, You can handle this. You can handle this, especially if you think as a collective, because there are a lot of people who know how to get through things like this. So let's just continue to talk to one another. And we have to bear witness so that we can shape the narrative for the future. They can't tell this story. Absolutely. We need to know how this went down. What, no matter what the result is, we need to know how this went down so that we can move forward and we know exactly what went right or what went wrong. 